Hi, Gary Stearman, time for another Prophecy in the News Daily update, and we're going to talk about the Russians today. Uh, the Russians are back. Uh, we have mentioned Russia in prophecy now for decades, uh, literally going all the way back to the founding of uh, the state of Israel in 1948, and then coming forward uh, up through the 60s, 70s, 80s. Russia was a big power in the Middle East, selling arms to anyone who would buy them. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia pulled back for a while. Now Russia has returned uh, in full force, although in a very subtle way. Uh, the Russians are catering to the Iranians, to Hezbollah, and also to the Alawite Muslims, and that would be Bashar al-Assad, <clears throat> and they're trying to secure a position for themselves. Uh, Israel Today magazine has published uh, an article called Russian Chess in the Middle East. And of course, the Russians' national sport is chess. Uh, and it has to do with what's going on in Syria today. Uh, it has to do also with Bible prophecy. Just to review briefly, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Ezekiel 38, it begins, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Well, Gog uh, and the structure of the named territories that surrounds him, uh, Gog is Russia, or a leader of Russia in the latter days. And many, many, many commentators for the last couple of centuries have put the finger on Russia as a ringleader in an, a great invasion that comes down uh, uh, ostensibly to sack Israel but fails in the process. Uh, Gog, the land of Magog, uh, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, all of those are place names that summon up uh, the idea of Russia. <clears throat> Russia. Russia is trying to save Syria. <clears throat> And we have this from Syrian authorities. Syrian authorities are ready to negotiate with the opposition and form a government of national unity, said Syria's deputy prime minister, Qadri Jamil, while rejecting President Bashar al-Assad's departure as a precondition for talks uh, during a press conference in Moscow on last Tuesday. Now, that's about a week ago. Uh, not quite a week ago. Although this is the first time that a high-ranking official has declared the regime's willingness to sit down for talks with rival forces trying to oust uh, the regime from power, the U.S. dismissed Jamil's remarks as, quote-unquote, insignificant. Well, far from that. <clears throat> State Department spokesman Victoria Newland insisted on Assad's resignation as the only way to prevent a stalemate. So far, the demand has been met with fierce opposition by the Russians and by the Chinese. And here's what we need to look at, and that is that uh, as this little dance continues, uh, the final days of Bashar al-Assad's government crumbling into non-existence, uh, probably to be taken over by the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, as this is happening, the Russians and the Chinese, but mostly the Russians, are positioning themselves to gain territory at the time of the collapse. <clears throat> and the Russians are already in a place uh, that will allow them to do this. This article from Israel Today uh, continues, quoting uh, a known authority in Russia, Dr. Jab Safarov, director of the Center for Modern Iranian Research, which is a pro-Iranian think tank based in Moscow, hence that the Kremlin's stance might originate in Russia's objection to America's attempt to reconstruct the Middle East. So now you have uh, the real game, and that is it's the Russians and the United States positioning themselves to see who is prominent in the Middle East, to, to see who uh, gets to cut up the pie with the most authority. Quote, the U.S. managed to organize the chaos that followed the Arab Spring, creating a region that has no place for Russian influence, argued this particular Russian pundit, uh, pointing out that the Kremlin 
has lost its foothold on Libya, including billions of dollars in energy and infrastructure deals after the Gaddafi regime was hastily replaced with elements favoring Washington. The Russians don't want that to happen again. And so this is the game that's going on right now. Meanwhile, and very importantly, we have this from the Times of Israel, datelined August 20th, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, quote, is determined to attack Iran before the U.S. elections. That would be November 6th, and uh, he is determined to attack Iran before U.S. elections. Why? Well, because he does not want to be thwarted in his efforts to uh, make the, that particular invasion count for what Israel wants it to count for. In other words, they want to be able to pull off an invasion that will uh, that change the, the uh, basic uh, power structure in the Middle East. The United States does not want that to happen. And so the United States has been putting the arm on Benjamin Netanyahu. We have this from Debka file, August 18th, U.S.-Israeli deal on Iran. No Israeli strike now if Obama pledges a spring attack. And so uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is going to be coming to Washington later this week. <coughs> uh, he's going to be sitting down for talks with Barack Obama. The subject is to be, will you, the United States, attack Iran in the spring if we postpone it for now uh, during the time of the U.S. elections. That's going to be the question on the table. And I quote, the White House this week scrambled to reconnect with Jerusalem after the Obama administration was persuaded that Israel was serious about conducting a fall military operation against Iran's nuclear program before the November 6th U.S. presidential election, notwithstanding the heavy opposition guns firing against it at home and from Washington. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Ehud Barak, assisted by their newly appointed Home Front Defense Minister, were seen deep in practical preparations for this operation and its repercussions, as well as an outbreak of hostilities with Syria and Hezbollah. And so there you have it. <clears throat> you have Russia and China maintaining a low profile, but wanting to pick up the pieces after a Syrian slash Iranian conflict uh, finally rears its ugly head. In the meantime, you have the American elections uh, counting down to November 6th. And if you can believe the news reports, the United States does not want Benjamin Netanyahu to, to attack Iran before November 6th, or, uh, or even before spring of 2013. Why? Because <clears throat> it is the goal of the United States to slowly and carefully control the map of the Middle East. Uh, they, they don't want a conflagration. They don't want an instant sea change of political power. They want to uh, make things happen gradually. And so this is the situation in Russia, China, the U.S., the U.S. elections, Benjamin Netanyahu seeing the need to attack the Iranians. What a recipe for disaster. Nobody can predict what's going to happen. <clears throat> but the Bible, nevertheless, Ezekiel 38, has Gog in a rapid-fire aerial airborne invasion into the Middle East. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. This is what is said of Gog uh, concerning that, that final invasion. You're going to come like clouds. You're going to come like a storm. Sounds like a rapid fire uh, vertical envelopment, uh, a, a, an aerial barrage of unprecedented proportions. Well, the Russians are preparing for all of this right now. So, uh, hmm. keep looking up, everybody. Mm -hmm.